So Sean, take over. Does Larry offer the full ski, or do they use translators? How does that work? I have no idea. You didn't go into any detail. Yeah. Sean might know. Well, I would love to regale everybody with exit polling in Poland. <laughs> well, please hey. do. I also have some vacation slides. Um, yeah, thank you, Jim, for having me here. Uh, for the last year and a half, I have been um, very lucky to have uh, a very unusual job, which is to say I have about four. Um, two days a week, I am Vice President of Programming and Music for Edison, working with stations on their research projects. For three days a week, uh, I work for Radio Info, writing the column Ross on Radio. Uh, if there is anybody here I am not spamming directly, um, <laughs> please give me your card. And, um, uh, and I will be able, I will be happy to send you um, my newsletter and also great offers on Akai Berry that I think will be of interest. <laughs> um, yeah, I've also been doing some independent programming, uh, consulting for radio stations. Um, I've also been doing some work for record labels that are outside the uh, tent of what Edison does. Um, I helped put on the first two oldie stations in Canada. Uh, three years ago, believe it or not, there had not been oldies on FM in Canada, and uh, you know, I'm happy to say they've both been tremendously successful. I also am developing a seminar based on something I've done for clients called Programming for Sales Staffs. Um, chances are that your programming department gets a lot of its information about what your station is doing from other sales reps from reluctant clients. Uh, and maybe if they're lucky enough to have a relationship with him that most uh, sales staffs don't have, maybe from the program director. Sometimes it's good to have an outside voice uh, come in, explain programming history, explain the market landscape, you know, and try to help your, the, your sales staff understand how, they got, you know, how the station got where it is. So that's something I'm developing for this year. I'm, here is Edison, but I'm also sort of here as Sean. This is the synthesis uh, of everything I do. I'm going to give you a very different perspective from what you've gotten from Larry and uh, last year from Tom Webster. Um, they, you know, their background is as researchers. Um, my background is as a format observer and also as a programmer who was lucky enough to then have access to a lot of research that helped you know, confirm or force me to rethink you know, what I had come up with. I've been, you know, it, it's been a terrific arrangement. Everything has fed everything else. Um, but what you're going to hear me talk about this morning is the current landscape um, as it affects our scenarios. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, what I'm not going to do this morning is present the Internet and Multimedia Study that we do every year because uh, it's not going to be released for another month. But even, uh, uh, even that being the case, I think that John and Stefan have done a great job of laying out the landscape. I think we all know what it is. I think what we have to talk about uh, is how we get from here to there. Uh, and the there is the, you know, it are the positive scenarios that we outline in the plan here. Um, I think what we do today is going to affect how successfully we get from here to there. Um, I think spinning our wheels is a distinct possibility. I think a lot of our best and brightest companies have spent just enough money on their digital strategies to waste it all. <laughs> um, I listen to a lot of streaming audio. I mean, the question I get is, how do you listen to all these radio stations? Uh, I spend a lot of time listening online. I have a lot of thoughts about the experience. Um, any of you who read the column know that I am a positive person. Any of you who read the column know that I am not one of the people in this business uh, who makes their living by going, you are all crazy, listen to me. You know, the, 
you know, you guys don't know what you're doing. Uh, I'm not that person. You know, I think that by and large we do know what, I'm, what we're doing, but I don't think it's necessarily translating today. Uh, and, I don't, and if we don't fix some things today, I don't think we're going to get where we're going. Um, I'm going to come in this morning somewhere between the times, being the times being Tom Webster and Tom Davis. Uh, I understand why Tom would tell you to think of a future without an AM-FM transmitter. That day is certainly coming. Uh, I think we have to prepare for it. Um, that said, I also believe in going from strength to strength. Um, I am a big believer in what radio offers people now. I am a big believer in the shared experience. Um, I think that people you know, obviously want to go on YouTube and watch Grandma Gets Owned by Brick. Yeah. <laughs> but people still want to watch Star Wars. You know, and we are in the business of offering them filmed entertainment that will be augmented by other things that don't necessarily exist. Um, I think we have to think of a lot of things that are completely outside the, the context of our current products. I think we have to operate on several tracks at the same time. But, you know, I'm here this morning because in part of the shared experience that John created at WLS. Um, if we are not the people offering that shared experience to people, shame on us. Uh, and here's something else. Pandora is a shared experience. You know, we think of Pandora as the other, but in fact, for the last two and a half years, a lot of people have been experiencing Pandora pretty much the same way uh, in a roughly similar time frame. Uh, I was at the country radio seminar uh, last week, and they did a focus group of, uh, of country listeners. Uh, and it was, you know, they were not good respondents. It was pulling teeth. It was like interviewing teenagers. Where do you go? Out. What did you listen to? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but they got to Pandora, and all of them, you know, I mean, not, not everybody in the focus group used it, but those who could described it in almost identical terms. They, they, they were pretty much writing the press kit for it. Um, Pandora is actually, you know, I think I've said this yesterday, and I mean, it very much is radio programming as everybody in this room understands it. In fact, it's pretty much the end of the 35-year quest for anybody who does music research to figure out how to not play any bad songs. Um, you know, the difference is now that, you know, we get to hone in on what no bad songs are instead of trying to come up, you know, with a group average that almost works. Uh, and by the way, um, you know, most people's definition of no bad songs is pretty much what they've told us in the last you know, 35 years of music research. Uh, I used the term plausible deniability yesterday. People like thinking that they don't have to listen to Prince 1999 and Madonna Like a Prayer, but you know, they mostly want to listen to those anyway. You know, and they mostly want to listen to Daniel Powder, Bad Day, anyway. They just like knowing that they, you know, that they wouldn't have to if they didn't want to. Um, because I am mostly optimistic, the theme of this speech this morning, uh, to steal a country song title from Rodney Crowell, uh, is the answer is yes. There has been a lot of discussion, you know, before, before I leave Pandora and move on to other things, there has been a lot of discussion about <coughs> whose time they're beating, if anybody's. Are they replacing the 8-track, the cassette deck, the iPod? Are they replacing traditional programmed radio? The answer is yes. Um, they have been just one of the reasons that distinction is becoming increasingly meaningless. Um, I've, you know, I've been consuming produced radio for, you know, for 42 years. Um, and even for me, it's not always a meaningful distinction. And for an 18-year-old, it is completely not a meaningful distinction. Beyond that, 
radio's TSL is declining. You know, a little bit among 50-year-olds precipitously uh, among you know, whoever moves into the 18 to 24 age group. Um, if they're not the ones getting our TSL, somebody is. Uh, so it is not inconceivable to me, by the way. I mean, when, to go, you know, uh, another question, are we in the curation business? Are we in the personalization business? And once again, the answer is yes. Um, one of the things I will throw out there, and it's easier for me to throw it out there than to come up with a game plan in the next two days, but you know, I will throw it out there for you guys to discuss. Why aren't we going after the time that goes to iPods? You know, if the people in the, you know, if the people who are replacing my music are coming after our time, Maybe one of the things we should do is start going after theirs. Um, it's just one way I think that we need to operate. We need to operate on several fronts. Um, I think we need to operate in several quadrants. I think we will, you know, I mean, I hope we are in the milk and honey quadrant, but I think we will be lucky to be lucky Luddites. I think even that is by no means promised to us. I think we are competing for that, you know, for our place with listeners every day. Uh, and there are things, you know, again, there are things we can do to make ourselves more competitive on that front today. Um, but I'm going to talk about several areas where I think we can shore ourselves up. And the first is simulcasting our terrestrial signals online. I don't think simulcasting is the magic bullet. I think we are all agreed on that. Um, that said, I think it has to be done adequately in a way that does not decrease the value of our products. Um, I spend, you know, it's our core competency. It's the thing we have at this moment. Uh, and again, if we're not doing it right, shame on us. I spend, as I said, a lot of time with the with streaming audio. I actually spent a lot of time listening to uh, a number of the stations represented in this room, and I think we're doing it better than most people. Um, I think as an industry, we are doing a better job than we did a year ago. A year ago, I think a lot of streams were unlistenable. Um, a year ago, I was hearing certain major group streams spend eight minutes replacing their stop set with fill PSAs, and then, two songs later, interrupt the music to run a stop set with paid ads. <laughs> um, you know, I think everybody knows what was running a year ago. I mean, uh, you know, four, you know, four sets of rotating PSAs about the dire things that were going to happen to your kids. <laughs> and I'm not anti-PSA, but I am but I do feel that if you turn into an AC station for the stress-free workday, you are perhaps not ready to engage on the dire things that are going to happen to your kids at that moment. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a second. I'm going to talk about creating national brands uh, in a world where there are 13,000 radio stations on AM and FM, in a world where there are, as John pointed out, uh, more streams than people to hear them. Um, did I characterize that correctly? Yeah. Um, obviously, there has to be a reason uh, why yours is the one of the 17 jacks that's available on, you know, on the cbsradio.com. There has to be a reason why yours is going to be the, one of the 30 KISS FMs that people choose to listen to. Uh, I think it's doable. Uh, and I think it, creating national brands is doable even within the context of doing great local radio. Um, I don't see it as a conflict and I don't see it as taking our eye off the ball and I'll talk about that in a second too. <coughs> creating new national brands to service the needs of people who aren't getting what they want in a local market. Um, obviously John is living in that world already. I think we should we all have the opportunity to live in that world. I think it's one of the great things that the technology has given us. Um, 
you know, there was some discussion yesterday about whether that would be the continuation of business as usual. Uh, I don't think so, because it doesn't exist. Uh, I think we have the opportunity to create a whole country of CKLWs and WLSs and NPRs, uh, and you know, nobody has yet really gotten around to doing that. Not even the people who operate on a national platform. I think Sirius XM uh, has wasted their opportunity so far to be a national shared experience. Uh, and finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about controlling the infinite dial. There are 13,000 radio stations, and right now, they're not being curated by us. They're being curated by a 22-year-old kid who doesn't even like AM, FM radio somewhere. Uh, we need to make sure that people are going to be able to find our radio stations in the future. So we'll talk about that a little. Um, Let's go back to, the, you know, to streaming our current signals. I listened to about eight stations representing people in this room. I, rep I listened to some clear channel stations. I listened to some CBS stations. I listened to Pandora. Um, you know, Pandora is, at this moment, 160 and 210s an hour. Um, the terrestrial stations I listened to, uh, including some represented in this room, I'm happy to say <coughs> were not crazy. Um, none of them were actually more than eight minutes. Um, I was listening you know, sometimes at night, sometimes middays. I actually heard some stations in this room um, with two to four minutes an hour. Uh, obviously, that's probably not by your choice, but I think we can work with that. It's first quarter. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it was first quarter, and in some cases it was 10 o'clock at night. But guess what? Um, that's actually going to represent an opportunity for us, you know, and we'll talk about that in a second, too. Um, compared to a year ago, I don't hear stations running extra spots. Compared to a year ago, I do not hear quite the same rotating wheel of dire PSAs. I now hear, you know, the rotating wheel of TurboTax ads. You know, I hear, but you know, at least, you know, at least it's professionally produced you know, and consistent with the rest of the entertainment product. Um, I do hear ample evidence that people here have gone back and instituted what they've learned uh, in previous years here. Uh, I heard a lot of spots directing me to people's various web initiatives. For instance, um, you know, I heard Tom's station talking you know, relentlessly, as it should, about being, about being live and about you know, you know, and coming as close to, you know, explaining the curation process on the air, you know, as a radio station practically can. You know, I think, you know, I think you have gotten your money's worth from the last couple of years in terms of presenting something that's as good online as the CBSs or Clear Channels. Um, you know, I heard one major group-owned station where I lost, you know, the, I lost the stream four times in the course of the hour and had to watch the pre-roll three times. <laughs> you know, Was it I, the same spot each time? Yes. Okay. That's uh, the design. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think we're, I, you know, I'm sure they're not unhappy about that, even if it's not. So, I, mean, I think we are further ahead of people, but, you know, I think we still need to take command of those periods you know, between the stop sets. I think a lot of us in this room are lucky enough not to have the after issue, uh, and I think we should turn that to our advantage. I think a lot of people do good spots for local advertisers, and when I talk about national brands in a second, I'm going to talk about how I think part of what we can do for our local advertisers is to make them famous nationally. All right. Um, National brands. I think everybody in this room probably has a station that could be one. Um, my wife lives 10 miles south of the, of the place where our AAA station loses its signal. Um, she needs to find a AAA station somewhere. Why shouldn't it be from Williamsburg? Uh, I think everybody here probably has something 
that could somehow be appealing to, you know, to not just the audience in their market. Um, yeah, you know, there are probably a lot of people in this room who don't have a station that they would listen to for themselves. You know, anywhere in their portfolio, anywhere in their market, necessarily anywhere nationally. Um, I think, you know, because some of us are entrepreneur owners, we've probably, you know, some of us have the option to create that station for ourselves, some of us don't. Um, I think we have the option now, whether it's a local station or whether it's a standalone national brand, to have the stations we want to listen to and, you know, in fact, to have the stations that a lot of other people want to listen to who don't have a radio station. Um, we have the opportunity to create great brands in classical. We have the opportunity to create great brands in first generation oldies. We have the opportunity to create a national standards product um, you know, as adult standards disappears from the radio in many places. So, you know, although ironically not Hilton Head where they got one three days ago. Um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and we have the, uh, you know, and we have the opportunity to, you know, to take smooth jazz forward and to offer people the smooth jazz format that they were perfectly happy with. Uh, because it wasn't the audience that was unhappy with smooth jazz in a lot of cases, it was the sales staffs. Um, we have the opportunity to take the music that's not quite on the radio yet, but is selling albums. Right now, I mean, the only thing that's selling albums, um, you know, on a consistent basis, week after week, besides the Pink and Britney Spearses of the world, uh, is indie rock. And nobody has really figured out how to do that on the air yet. You know, those guys you've never heard of who came on at the end of the Grammys, you know, they have a following. Um, you know, Arcade Fire has a following. Mumford & Sons has a following. Um, you know, Adele has a following. She will be on the radio in about two months. And, uh, but, you know, uh, Top 40 is coming around now. But you know, that record's been out a month. And, you know, a week ago it was getting three spins at Top 40. Um, you know, there is an opportunity to get at the music that your 18-year-olds listen to, you know, that your 18-year-olds are turning you on to, that there is not a radio station for yet. Um, you know, did 18-year-olds jump or were they pushed? Uh, you now know that the answer is yes. Um, yeah, and, you know, there are certainly lots of 18-year-olds who are happy listening to Top 40, but right now it's the only choice for current music. So we have the opportunity to, you know, we have the opportunity to tap into a lot of music that's not on the radio yet that sells records. We have the opportunity to find out what else it is that a 16-year-old might like to listen to and give it to them on a platform that they might be interested in listening to it on. Um, you know, ample national brand opportunities. Um, you know, let's talk about creating national brands from the stations we already have. Um, you know, again, we would all listen to K-Bear in Sicily, Alaska, you know, for the station from Northern Exposure, if that station really existed. Um, you know, why shouldn't every community be, you know, Sicily, Alaska? Why shouldn't every community be the, you know, be the fictional Prairie Home Companion community? You know, why shouldn't every place, you know, why shouldn't in the course of serving your local audience, uh, you not create a mystique about your own market uh, that gives it a sense of place and makes your station a compelling national brand. Um, Jane Charneski, formerly of Edison, um, you know, now in the ad and trends business, uh, gave a presentation on a panel I moderated about you know, upcoming formats at NAB in September. Um, Jane has a panel of, you know, of teens and 18 and 20 somethings to talk to. And one of the things that she found that would be appealing to them was a radio station with a sense of place. So, you know, our, the, our communities are, you know, our communities to us, they are potentially exotica to other people. And I think that's a marketable thing. And, you know, to answer the next question, why would you have any interest? How would you monetize being heard in another market? Um, I'm going to throw this out there for, for discussion for the next two days. What could we be doing to turn our local merchants into national merchants on the web? 
what could we be doing to put them into the internet or, or mail order business? Um, you know, I mean, I listen to, you know, I listen to stop sets with four local spots and, you know, some of them are not things that you need to order from out of town, but some of them could be. So I think that's something worth considering as we look for, you know, what could be in the good quadrant and what that would look like. Um, finally, I want to talk about controlling the infinite dial. I want to come back to the issue of how stations are curated. Again, I think I'm going to give you more to talk about. And I think it's one where we're going to have to talk toward a solution. I, you know, I don't necessarily have a solution yet for myself, but I think it's a problem. Uh, I th you know, if you look at iTunes, it took the major broadcasters years to get on there. Um, you know, for years it was being curated by somebody in California who was as interested in 977 hits as they were in your radio station. Um, the major groups finally got smart and started asking for the order, and now you see CBS represented there, you see Cox represented there. Uh, you don't see Clear Channel represented there. Um, you know, CBS has made the decision to be everywhere, even if they don't control the stream, and Clear Channel is thus far still trying to, you know, to send people to iHeartRadio. Um, you know, I can tell you that you know when I spent, when I use my iPhone as a transistor radio, um, you know, I tend to go to a stream aggregator because everybody is there, uh, and you know, your station should be there too. Um, but you know, we have let we've let Apple curate for us. We have let uh, aggregators like uh, like Radio Time curate for us. <coughs> you know, and soon, um, you know, we will have the car companies curating for us. And you know, I mean, again, the car companies, um, even though all they are really allowing you to do is plug your phone into the car the way you do now, but more elegantly and with a dashboard interface. Um, you know, I mean, they've been out there talking about Pandora. They have not been out there talking about our radio stations. Um, or the, I thought a year ago, most of them would just create their own radio and offer that to people in the dash, and Pandora turned out to be a more compelling shortcut for them. But either way, they're the ones choosing and we're not. You know, we have spent a lot of time lobbying the car companies uh, on behalf of HD radio. Imagine if we were using that time lobbying the, the, you know, lobbying the car companies instead about making our stations easy to find in the dashboard. When there are 13,000 radio stations, whoever controls the directory um, you know, is going to have a lot of power. Uh, has anybody seen Media Player uh, from the UK, the, the radio player that's being done there? Um, I would urge you to check it out. It's, uh, the broadcasters there have all teamed up. It's being debuted, I believe, this week. Um, they're going to start with 150 stations, and you know, the, there will be up to about 300 and some uh, quickly. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a lot easier to do when you're talking about a country with 300 to 500 radio stations than 13,000, but it is a good-looking player. And it is very much a case of broadcasters there taking their destiny into their own hands. Uh, and I think we need to figure out how to do that. We ha need to have stations, first of all, that are worth being found. Uh, and then we need to have stations that you can find. Uh, and both of those things are going to be harder. Um, and finally, um, I'm going to revisit something I wrote about last year to resounding silence. <laughs> um, which is spot load. Um, I don't think Pandora will be, you know, 160 and 210s forever. Um, but let's say it gets up to four minutes. That's still, you know, half of what we're offering people in most cases. It's sometimes a quarter of what we're offering people. Um, I think we have to plan for a world where you know, where 10 to 16 minutes of commercials will just never be tenable again. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of great advertising. 
Um, yesterday, when someone, when someone said, who watches TV, I didn't raise my hand. When someone said, who watches the commercials, I did raise my hand. Um, yeah, I, you know, my wife and I actually have lots of discussions about not TiVoing past the commercials, because I'm one of those people for whom they are actually more interesting than the programs. <laughs> uh, you know, I watch Mad Men, and I think it's great, but it would be better, even better if there was more advertising. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if, if, you know, if Don would stop having affairs and do more product pitches. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, the, I like our advertising. I like our advertising when it's done well, but, you know, I listened to a major group-owned station that the good news was they were filling their commercials set, you know, they were filling their web stop set with something other than dire PSAs. Uh, the bad news is that it was 1230s. Um, <laughs> you know, not even if you turned over your entire stop set to Dick Orkin yeah. do I want to hear 1230s. Um, we are going to have to do something about that. Uh, if we can do it with our existing stations, terrific. Um, not being able to do it with our existing stations is probably the most compelling reason for having to start over with our online offerings because, you know, again, two and a half minutes versus 12 minutes. What do you think people are going to choose? How much curation can we offer them? How much local information can we offer them? How much entertainment can we offer them that makes 12 minutes better than two and a half minutes or even competitive with two and a half minutes? Um, it is first quarter. Stations are undersold. People are putting a lot of new radio stations on the air through the miracle of HD or AM translator combos that are at this moment new and undersold. Um, I think being on the air and saying, you know, only four minutes of commercials an hour ever is pretty powerful. I think, the, I think at some point someone is going to have to go on the air and say fewer commercials than internet radio. I think someone is going to have to sell that um, and I think someone is going to have to figure out how to make the sponsorship model work. So far, the pioneers have gotten all the best arrows. Uh, the people who have tried to find a world where people sell sponsorship and not spots. Uh, I think Clear Channel complicated things in Dallas uh, by taking a classic rock station that would have been a very good candidate and you know, deciding at that moment to not only do the sponsorship model, but to try to do Americana in a major market. You know, I think you can do one thing or the other. Um, yeah, and I think we never really got a fair read on how well that could work. Um, I think we have to keep revisiting that one until we find a way to pull it off. Again, because I don't think 12 commercials an hour is going to be, you know, or 12 minutes an hour is going to be tenable forever. Uh, and those are my notes. Um, what would you like to discuss? What have I said this morning that, you know, that everyone's sitting there and going, you're crazy? I don't think you cried almost everything you said. You make really great points. One thing I find interesting, and something we refuse to do, um, and I've always refused to do in any stations that I've worked with, is commercial free yeah. hours. Anything that says the word that implies the commercial is bad. First of all, I find that to be an insult to our advertiser. If I was advertising, you know, I would feel like, wow, you're basically telling me you hate to give me what I just bought. And yeah. The second element is, if the commercials are as good as they possibly can be, if they're creative, if they send a positive message that creates value, why wouldn't we want to promote the fact that we have great ads? I'm with you on not insulting the advertisers. Uh, maybe the way to phrase it is, as much music every hour as internet radio. I think that's a positive. Um, I think commercials being entertaining and part of the package you know, has to speak for themselves. I think, you know, I think the good ones earn their place on the radio, and I think you do a very good job you know, of making sure that they earn their place on the radio. Did you read about Clear Channel's production cuts? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, great day. Yeah. Because, you know, you're right, Chuck. You know, no matter how good the commercials are, 
I think you're being generous to, to, the, to the industry when you say you're, you're 12 minutes or 12 units. I, you know, when I listen to the streams, it's more like 14 to 16. I mean, that's the commercial load in, in a lot of radio stations. And, and no matter how good the commercials are, there's no way you can continue to jam that down people's throats uh, when there are more and more opportunities at, at lower levels. I mean, you know, back in the 60s, FM was popular because it had eight minutes and AM had 12 minutes. Think about it. AM had 12 minutes back then. Okay. And I thought at WLS I was running a lot of commercials when I'm running 12 minutes versus the FM stations that were running eight. And, and, and how do you, you start to ratchet that back to be competitive? Yeah, in 1993 I had two fives and I thought that was a lot. <laughs> uh, and I also actually uh, managed to, uh, at WGCI AM Chicago, managed to create a live overnight slot that had not previously existed. And I can't imagine that possibly happening. You know, I, I thought you said something interesting. I, I hadn't really thought about this, but we don't have a national radio brand and in the no. sense of that there, there, there's one product. I mean, NPR may be the closest in morning drive because it's the same program on every station, you know, across right. the country. But other than that, I can't think, and Rush, you know, Rush to a certain degree, but. But those are programs. There's no national radio <coughs> brand like like the Monitor was back in the 50s. Right. Oh, yeah. that, that, there, that, that there is, John. Educational Media Foundation, K Love Radio. Yeah, K Love's a terrific Very good point. Yeah. 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 But and they're yeah. very successful. Yeah. Yeah. No commercials. And that's been flying under the under the radar because generally they're not being measured uh, by you know by our, I don't know if they're they they not. Take a look. Take a look at any metered market. Yeah. Where they have the full more station, our top ten station. Yeah, number three yeah. in Denver this okay. month. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and they are, you know, I mean, for all the real radio people in here, um, you know, it's being programmed by people who were, you know, by Mike Novak from KFRC. Um, you know, it is real radio, as all of us know it and yeah. believe in it. Sean, I had a thought. We were talking about if you had a unique product that was worthwhile then to take the local sponsors and turn them sort of like an international yeah. brand or whatever. And one of the things I kind of uh, noticed is, uh, you know, living now down in Bowling Green is WSM, obviously, a program, first of all, yeah. more live programming, not sports or something else, but live music programming, and they, <coughs> else. they also do it on the network, but they're, and some of their sponsors have been with the station for 65 years. But one of their great sponsors is a farm that makes all natural chickens. It's the only one in the United States I can certify with nothing in it. It's it a healthy place. Spring Mountain Farms. Can't buy them in Bowling Green. I'm only 60 miles yeah. up the road. You can't buy those. Mm -hmm. Brentwood Jubilee and Gifts. You got to go to Brentwood, Tennessee to go. So a lot of their spot in Valley Man is out there, and I guess Cracker Barrel is you know, certainly more prolific right. along the East Coast, but I, I don't think they're out west. What do you, how would you grow that? And then my other thought was when you get services like if you use Google, and you try, I tried using Bing when it came on because I thought I'd try, I, I wasn't satisfied with, with the results. Google works. YouTube. Bing uses what? Google too. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. But I mean, like YouTube, what would be the replacement? Facebook. Amazon. It, not only do I like Amazon to buy stuff, but I'd rather buy it from Amazon than one of their second or third party suppliers because I know I have any trouble. Amazon sends me the thing, they, they pay for the shipping back, and so I yeah. can't deal, deal with it. So once you get that position, what dislodges it? I mean, what could somebody do to, to sell me a book that I wouldn't want to buy from Amazon instead? I think that's a valid point, but I also think that part of what we've learned to do as a sales strategy is to put, is to help local merchants go on the web in the first place. I mean, and you could also make that argument for them. You know, I mean, they are getting on there at a disadvantage you know, against the Amazons of the world, but they're going to do more being on there um, than they are not being on there. Um, a thought. I, I think that radio has the opportunity to, once we can have interactivity, when you can buy something when you hear it, it's the immediacy. And if you hear a book on, on, on the radio and you're listening on, online, to be able to immediately buy what that local advertiser is selling online easily through the radio station, instead of having to go home, go on Amazon, and, and do that process far after, if, if there's a way for radio to make it instantaneous for its advertisers to sell something to the audience at the moment they hear it, 
that I think is going to be a huge advantage, and that's possible. Yeah, I, I, think, I think my point though is once you get established, and that's that's the, no. the, the my, my thinking through on this is Pandora seems to be going down that road of these other services, Facebook and Google. Right. And Amazon. So once you own the beach, the problem now becomes you need to have a reason for somebody to leave something they like. Now the only thing that would get me to leave NPR right now is they blow up NPR no. and no longer exist. I don't see a replacement service for that. And I think anybody who thinks they can do that, I read the uh, Eric Rhodes thing, and he said, you know, what an opportunity. And I said, does he have any idea? Paying performance royalties would look like a gift to trying to duplicate NPR. So I, I think that's a, a very you know, short-sighted view of life. But short of blowing up that service, what would dislodge me from wanting to listen to something that would be competing with it? I think, at the very least, you're competing for the people who still choose from among radio stations. I think, you know, I think for the people who are listening to Pandora, what will, what will dislodge them uh, if something comes along, it will be, you know, it will be a Facebook, uh, MySpace situation. It will be something that we can't even imagine now, um, or it will be something that is new now and has not yet you know, gained critical mass. But I think, in terms of the, you know, I am going to listen to a radio station. Who is it? You know, whose is it going to be? Is it going to be? You know, am I going to go online and choose from my locals who don't necessarily offer me what I want, or am I going to find a AAA station that's not available in my market? Um, you know, I think we can have that person, and I think we have to. Uh, I think we have to say, why shouldn't that be us?